Thank you all for joining me tonight. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, modern data engineering practices and how we implemented a, an architecture that works at the CSU. So we'll start off an agenda. Um, I'll just go through this quickly. Not, I'll just talk, give you a brief overview of who am I, um, then talk about the CSU, and then I'll start with uh, the data lake architecture that I um, worked on implementing at the CSU and go over some of the um, key features that we implemented. Uh, it also allowed us to scale, you know, grow rapidly, build multiple use cases, and now we are uh, one of the key focus groups that uh, multiple, um, you know, um, other groups use us for leveraging the um, skills and technologies to bring their use cases to the forefront. Um, so who am I? So uh, I'm the director for cloud data engineering at the Cal State University Office of the Chancellor. Sorry, it's going uh, it's forward. Uh, I'm also the founder for Data Connelly, which is uh, the largest, largest data conference in the SoCal region. Um, in fact, the conference is in, in just two weeks, right, two weeks, yeah, August 13th. We're going to be at, the, at USC. Um, and then I'm on the founder for Data for Good, which is a non-profit using data for solving social challenges. I was recently awarded the AWS Education Champion Award. Uh, I'm going to Seattle next week to um, get the um, award and citation. And then I was uh, I'm, um, so senior members of ACM and IEEE. Uh, so CSU, uh, so what are we? So um, it's a public university. Uh, probably a lot of you have heard about it. Uh, and it's the largest four-year degree in the nation with uh, uh, nearly half a million students and about 50,000 faculty. So I'm in the Chancellor's office, which is, we, we're not actually a, a campus, but we kind of, uh, we're like the hub and spoke for all 23 campuses and we primarily work, uh, you know, gain the data from all 23 campuses, we process it for them and then we send it over to them um, on a daily basis. Uh, and then every year we award nearly 100,000 bachelors, masters, and doctoral degree. So with that, let's get started. So the uh, first thing I want to talk about is the data trends. So uh, one of the key things that we have noticed over the past decade or several decades is the fact that data has been growing exponentially. I mean, you've seen this just in the daily trends. I mean, the amount of data that your phone collects or the um, data, you, you know, watching Netflix or um, in the, you're know, browsing a web, there's a lot of data that comes in. So um, using that data, I mean, people can, you know, make recommendations, do a number of things that kind of make your life, suppose, supposedly make your life easier, but also can make it complicated, you know, with data privacy challenges, you know. Um, your data getting hacked, for one thing, data getting, being misused uh, or being sold to third-party companies to deliver ads to you. So there's a lot of um, pros and cons with, you know, data being generated. So um, these are trends that you can see, you know, the exponential growth, the new sources that it comes for, the amount of diversity comes in data, and then the fact that it's being used by multiple people as well as many applications. So what does that mean? So it also means, kind of means that people need to have a way to process the data. Someone needs to actually go in and actually uh, create um, an architecture platform for uh, creating meaningful uh, results from that data. So you, you kind of think about this as companies moving to a data lake architecture which kind of means bringing the best of both worlds. So if you think about um, data warehousing, which was the paradigm, you know, 20 years ago, even today, I mean, you still see a lot of data warehouses in scope, but uh, we need to move beyond that. I mean, the fact that data warehouses work very well for structured data, but don't handle semi-structured and unstructured data as well, means, means you need to have a uh, scope or mechanism to handle that data in a better fashion. Plus, when you talk about data scientists, uh, they always are saying, you know, we need clean data. We need a data to be uh, scrubbed. A lot of that, uh, you know, obviously you can do some of that with uh, your data warehouses, but not all of it. And um, you want to do all of that cleaning and scrubbing at the beginning of a pipeline versus towards the end, because when the data lands in a data warehouse, it's already been transformed. Uh, if you want your data scientists to make maximum value of data, they pre prefer that they get access to the data sources, and they, uh, part of that is making sure that the data is um, clean for them to use. So uh, what would that mean? So it extends and evolves, you know, data architectures, stores data in any form, Matt. Sorry, this thing is, I don't know if I can turn my head with this. I just gotta remove my headphones out. Something is, give me one second. There you go. Or not. Sorry. 
नहीं हो मीना सॉरी बहुत तुम नितिन कर मैंने much better uh and then you can run any type of analytics from data warehouse to predictive so uh i got this image from somewhere i liked it so i said welcome to the data lake so uh, i'm going to talk to you about you know what this means i mean from future perspective of how we combine structured and structured and semi structured data how do you build something that can make sense as you grow so uh, the concept of uh, data lake came about uh, you know maybe i would say 5 Uh, to six years ago, um, they kind of extended the data warehouse and said, you know, let's talk about bringing, um, you know, uh, some structured and structured data. So uh, things like, you know, object storage. So things like your S3, um, AWS S3. You know, how do you combine that with your um, data warehouse to make that more of a system, a platform from where you can extend and evolve your data architecture? So you talk about things like, you know, your BI, your reports. Uh, data science machine learning and you combine all of that into your data lake uh, but uh, over time there is one thing that kind of people also started asking like you know uh, this is great i mean now we bring in semi structured and structured data but we still don't talk about how do we um, you know clean the data master the data how do we actually make use of the data so uh, one of the things that people started discussing that you know we need to bring some kind of data governance into the frame uh, data governance is basically this uh, concept that's been around for i would say maybe decades now it may be two decades at least it basically talks about how do we ensure that we have a consistent data philosophy across the board not just within the group that you are in but across multiple groups so things like you know master data management metadata management data lineage um uh, data quality management data catalog data dictionary these are key fundamental things as the data governance uh, tools need to be uh, brought to the forefront today uh, most organizations have a very um i would say a uh, lean uh, or uh, not not non existent data governance um, framework and that's the part of the reason because there is no tool set out there that supports this kind of tool tooling around you'll see bits and pieces over there even most clouds today you, you will see them also support data catalog that's about as much as you would see from there if you look at third party tools i mean you probably see bits and pieces out there like you probably see someone just do mdm or someone just do uh, metadata management but nobody does the gamut of that i mean one of the closest tools i've seen that's come to picture is um um uh, uh informatica but that's super expensive uh colibra is also another company that's kind of working towards building a, a enterprise uh, a data governance tool set but again it's bits and pieces no one does and uh, does everything and the uh, last part aspect on menti um mention is also the fact that uh part of the reasons also very difficult to do is the data silos within organizations most organizations have you know multiple groups uh, all of them have their own created data sets all of them have their own you know data dictionaries which they don't share across the organizations so uh, i i'll probably talk to you this concept of data mesh which is basically the talk about um, bringing together all these data silos in some way or form and combining them so that doesn't become a silo so data mesh can basically is kind of like a abstract layer that's built on top of your data silos that supposedly makes everything more um uh, uh visible to all of the users but again that's it's it's not um um completely uh, open it is people do talk about it but at the same time they um getting that to um something works is something that uh, is uh, it's rarely seen let me put it that way so the um, next piece that you know i when i started at um, uh cloud state university uh part of the um, reason they brought me on is because they were just starting the cloud journey and they wanted to have something that's more cloud focused now uh i inherited a team of engineers that were all you know sql engineers they were pretty much uh, spent decades writing oracle sql and for the most part that's great but one of the key philosophies that i kind of developed over the years is that i like um, um this terminology called devops which is kind of built um, on on the devops philosophy which has been around now for about say 15 plus years but the key thing i liked about devops is testing um and i saw one of the key things is that you know this was a good way to start um you know building the team to understand how chd can work in an organization such as cs now csu is very uh, legacy oriented so all of the technologies is legacy based you'll probably see more oracle and, and people soft database is anything that's uh, 
you know, uh, kind of modern data engineering that's out there. So uh, the first thing that we did, or what I did, was like I started retraining my Go group. So we, I reskilled, upskilled them to start saying that you know, how do we build something like this? So we need to come up with a platform that's scalable and um, can evolve in a very structured manner. So we started looking at you know building multiple environments. So we now have a dev and a prod environment. Um, we also have a, a, a staging environment, but that's more of a, a, a launch as you need and shut down when you don't need it. Uh, but the good piece of that is now we actually have an environment that makes it easier for us to write code. So uh, the other thing I did was I switched everyone from SQL. And we still use SQL today. We don't get, we haven't got rid of SQL, but the fact of the matter is SQL is not the best mechanism to write test cases. I mean, if you've, if you have written SQL, if you have looked at SQL, you probably see you know um, complex SQL statements that are very hard to debug. You know, especially when something happened in production. You know what happens? I mean, where do you debug? You debug and you change the code in production. You see those memes out there, and I've done it before. Um, you always end up when something fails in production, you always debug in production. Um, that's not something that I like. I mean, I've ca made the team you know, move completely away from that. So how do you do that? So first thing, you need to move people away from thinking about everything needs to be SQL based. So SQL has its place and position. I don't say that you, uh, you get away from SQL, but you need to know where you need to use it. And you also need to know that SQL, uh, um, even though that you can write very complicated SQL statements, it's not the best case to uh, identify and debug situations. And if you do write SQL to me, I always push my team to make sure that they uh, modularize their SQL statements, break it down in more functional, uh, logical equivalents, so that you can write test cases against that. Uh, so that leads me, leads me to the other part of the statement. So what do we move from SQL towards? So most data engineering pipelines today kind of uh, move to Spark, and we, that's the kind of pl the platform that we use. If you ask the uh, data engineering uh, platform what the uh, tool of choices or the programming choices, probably Spark, and for uh, I would say 70 to 80% cases, it's going to be PySpark. Because just because it's more easier to learn, because it's a Python based development environment. So we went with that. So uh, things that we did, we did uh, deployment pipeline, you know, repeatable, reliable process, automate everything. So uh, today we follow uh, uh, continuous delivery uh, cycle. So we push to production once a week. And at some point, we'll go to deployment, but uh, at this point we are focused on the delivery. And then we version control everything. So this allows us to um, roll back much more faster than we used to do in previous cases. Also production, nobody has access. Really the admins have access to production. That means all the developers, if something breaks, they actually have to apply hot fixes and uh, roll them out to production in a much more release-oriented cycle. So it's more a very DevOps-friendly way of doing things, but it allows us to be more flexible and grow more rapidly. Uh, the other thing we kind of uh, kind of push the team is to make sure that we write uh, reusable functions, you know, uh, extensible frameworks. So everything that we have, we kind of follow that kind of pattern. So if uh, anybody else comes on, they can just reuse uh, functions from that are already written. We don't have to reinvent the cycle. So th that's one of the things that I really like about how we build this out. So how do we implement this? So first thing that we did is I kind of told my team, we need to break this down into uh, compartmentalize them into uh, 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 divisible portions and then work on them in individual uh, components. So, uh, like what is this? Uh, the first thing is the ingress part. So, uh, uh, first thing I said is that you need to have a component or a framework that can ingest data from anything. So today, most of the data is batched, but we have actually written code that can also ingest, um, you know, um, streaming data. So we have some streaming use cases that is built in the framework, but it's also extensible to handle most kind of uh, third-party platform. So we have our tool sets, you know, MuleSoft, Boomi that can plug into us and push the data set so we can easily use that. Or we could use, um, you know, DMS, AWS data migration services. We could use uh, uh, flat files. We can use uh, uh, FTP servers. All of that has uh, individual components that you already built in that could be just extensive, extended and uh, used by anybody that wants to launch into a platform. So. That makes things easier for uh, third-party uh, developers. Uh, the next piece uh, that we also did is that we standardize all of our file formats. So if you land in our uh, S3 buckets, the first thing that we do is we convert them to Parquet. Um, so Parquet is a file format that's used today very uh, heavily in um, um, data processing world uh, just because it's uh, um, uh, what we call them a file format allows for more performance-based processing. and uh, it gives more structure to the data by allowing you to uh, understand and uh, uh, extract um, um, 
uh, uh, crawl your data much more easier and apply that to your data catalog. So we see that uh, kind of uh, framework that's built out that allows us to scale. Uh, second piece that we did is we follow, um, we, uh, once a data lands in S3, we kind of follow a framework for processing. Now today, uh, all of our data, all of our applications are AWS. The reason that we use AWS pretty heavily today is just because of the fact that uh, we have a really good partnership with AWS and we can just use any application within application, I mean, tool set on AWS without having to uh, worry about licensing. So, um, because being a public, you know, say every time we, um, you know, want to use a third party tool or application, there's a huge uh, legal uh, wrangling that we need to go through. So, that makes life harder for us. So, for just, just to get things, you know, quickly like launch, test things out, it makes it much more easier for us to start off with AWS and use their tool sets then work with something third party. Now that's not to say we can't do open source, but my team is so small. So I want to focus the team on things that, you know, we don't spend too much of time maintenance and administration. We focus on actually development and infrastructure and building those pieces out. So, uh, you know, you, uh, you, you, de you deal the card uh, or deal the hand that you have been dealt and you focus on things that you want to do, focus on the opportunities that you have and show where you can actually show uh, improve success. Because that's where you actually can, you know, bring value to the team. You know, show, uh, prove that this can grow and scale out. And then, uh, once uh, you have built that trust and confidence, then you can actually hire more people and do the other things that you want to do. So, so you have to like figure out, balance out what needs to be handled. And when you want to show success, those things are really key and important. Um, so, how does that work? So, uh, from our data ingress, uh, as I mentioned, we have used heterogeneous data sources. We are able to handle databases, uh, flat files, streaming data, uh, bring that on through multiple interfaces, process the data and store it in S3. So um, the first piece, you have to land in S3. Second piece, it has to be converted to Parquet. Now, if uh, ideally, we would like you to trans convert, drop your data into Parquet file format by default, but if you don't, we have a um, process that will, a Lambda uh, a function that actually uh, kicks off automatically, sees if your file is, um, you know, what do you call, uh, parquet um, um, ready. If not, it'll actually crawl your uh, file, figure out what the elements are, and then convert it to parquet. So we kind of have uh, automated that piece as well to allow us to more flexibility into understanding what we do. Now, a good piece of this is when we actually crawl the data sets, we actually store this into a data catalog. So a data catalog is kind of important because that's what we expose to all the other tool sets. So you kind of, kind, of, kind of like a single source of truth. So for uh, anything downstream, that kind of uh, wants to process the data, it kind of adds, uh, logs into the our AWS Glue, which is our data catalog provider, and pulls the uh, schema information. Uh, this also uh, allows us, if something changes uh, in the data set, we can uh, uh, you know apply the changes in our uh, data catalog, and any downstream process that uses it can actually uh, leverage the new uh, schemas and make uh, appropriate changes to the data set. So I'll talk a little bit more about what that schema changes mean in an automated fashion for us. Uh, before we go into this, any questions? I mean, cool. So, uh, from a uh, data ops process, how does this work? How do we actually apply this? So, um, this um, I, okay. This is how we actually. So, first we um, start with the uh, framework. So, you know, first we get the code base. Today uh, we're using Code Commit, which is a um, Git uh, clone. So, uh, it's uh, pretty much. Get, but they kind of wrap it up for AWS and we have code. Again, I said we're using AWS just because uh, we try to make our lives easier. We don't want to complicate too many things given that we have a small team. Um, so the framework, we uh, follow the uh, branching methodology. All, all the developers have their own branches. Then they uh, push into uh, the developer branch. First thing they need to merge. When they merge, uh, make sure there's no conflicts. If there's conflicts, resolve the conflicts. Um, we have a regression test in place. So all of the code needs to go through a regression test cycle, make sure it doesn't break any of the other code base. If it breaks, they need to fix it. But a typical good thing, the last person who checks it in is responsible of fixing all of the, uh, any of the code breaks that happen. And it doesn't get actually merged into developer until it actually fixes all of that. Uh, the key piece that we do over here is um, unit testing and integration testing. So um, the other piece that we want to make sure that all of the code has some kind of testing in place. Um, we have a minimum threshold today of 80%. We want to move to 90% over time. But if a uh, code coverage does not meet that threshold, it does not get into uh, get pushed into a, a developer repository. 
So if we want to make sure that developers go over time, they increase the number of tests that they include. Uh, today we follow um, Happy Path Medium. I mean, uh, we, um, um, I mean, there's this thing called TDD and BDD. Uh, we focus on BDD because uh, writing um, uh, all kinds of uh, unit testing is really hard. So we follow at least the most uh, uh, common path for uh, testing. So we can ensure that it follows at least some a method of uh, you know testing. Even though there are some, we had some more unit test cases based on edge cases that if uh, potent or foresee uh, could have happened during uh, processing the data in production. Triple key things that happen: uh, commit pull request. If there's somebody has to actually uh, ensure that. Uh, so we, we have a, uh, another developer actually uh, verify that the code is uh, looks good before he approves a PR. Uh, once a PR is more, we merge the uh, dev branch. And then uh, from there it goes to uh, our uh, master branch. Uh, we are working on. We have some containers in place. I mean, working on that. We haven't fully formalized the container approach for today. We're just using CloudFormation, uh, which is a Terraform clone, uh, which allows us to push into our um, um, production environment. So uh, part of the growth set is also ensuring that we have our Kubernetes um, our containers in place at some point so that we can scale this out to other environments. Uh, and we, it's kind of important because we are, uh, today we're using e AWS EMR, which is uh, Amazon's uh, um, data processing pipeline framework. Uh, but we've been talking to Databricks, which is one of the big uh, data processing companies out there. And we probably might switch over again. Uh, we're still in talks with them. Switch to Databricks. It means that our container um, philosophy has to be more uh, um, uh, in place before we do that transfer into Databricks. So how does the test automation work? Uh, so developer creates a pull request and notifies a approver for the um, you know um, PR, and then it's uh, checked for uh, are you going to approve the pull request or not. You run your unit testing and code uh, code um, coverage, and then if uh, something if if it's not approved, again goes back through the cycle. Developer has to check the code. Oh, sorry. Maybe that's better? A little bit, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, because then the people in the recording won't be here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Uh, then, uh, obviously, um, so today um, uh, we're using step functions. Now, this is uh, another airflow. Uh, if you heard Apache Airflow, that's become the default scheduler in most organizations. Um, but we're using step functions today, and our plan is also to migrate into uh, Airflow. Um, AWS supports uh, managed Airflow, uh, and um, we plan to take advantage of that in the near future. Uh, one of the reasons we didn't switch to Airflow today is because uh, it still does not integrate uh, fully well into EMR. But if we switch into uh, Databricks, we may have a better option opportunity to use. Uh, Airflow. Though now data, we've, we just uh, Databricks had their summit um, a couple a couple of weeks ago, and they announced their own workflow scheduler. So uh, that's the other uh, problem with all the other uh, tool sets. That you want. Everyone brings their own uh, uh, you know tool sets into picture. So you have to think twice. Should I use the, uh, what's uh, common out there? Should I move to over to uh, the tool sets by offered by some of these? other companies. Now, uh, Databricks claims they have workflow schedulers better it has better integration, but you know, it's a caveat. You are, uh, they want to tie you down into their own framework, so you have to think twice. Are you, uh, do you want to stick into the, uh, um, into something that it's proprietary, or do you want to move into something that's open? Now, Databricks always claims, you know, it's all open source. You can use it, but if you look at the code base, 80% of the code base is always uh, developed by Databricks. So again, you have to think, okay, is it uh, really open source or is it, is it just uh, Databricks supporting the, uh, uh, what do you call, application code base? So uh, food for thought, that's something that you want to think about. So uh, test automation, so how do we do testing? So um, today our testing is done with PyTest and Chespa. Uh, PyTest is an obviously a, a testing framework for Python. Uh, but when it comes to uh, testing um, uh, PySpark, which is what we use today, uh, there's no good framework out there. So we found this open source framework called Chespa that does a pretty decent job of testing PySpark, uh, PySpark code. So we started using that. And we use it in combination with PyTest. And then the test coverage is automatically collected and calculated. And 
because we already he kept a, you know put a threshold if it doesn't meet that threshold it doesn't get pushed on the other side of things is the egress the workflow um, so um, one of the things question I have a question Go ahead. so in your in your workflow um, they're, they're working on uh, the dev branch or whatever of your, of your code but do they also have like a sample of the data that's already in the system to run the dev yes time, that's, that's correct so no no so we have prod and dev environments so our dev environment is um, it's a call of a, a clean uh, or um, encrypted or redacted uh, subset of the data in prod. So if any level one PI data is there in our data set, that gets scrubbed and clean. And we put uh, only, um, we have a data retention policy, which is smaller than the uh, production. So production data has everything from all time, but uh, dev uh, is basically probably only about um, within seven and 90 days, depending on the data set that we collect. We uh, put a subset of that, but you also redact and encrypt an API level one data for uh, if you're testing and development. Uh, but th that basically allows us to create a, a code base to test against. Good question, anything else? So the other sort of things, then we have, a, uh, you know, egress. how does data get pushed or uh, extracted for a BI tool? Uh, today we support two BI tools, uh, which one is uh, called AWS QuickSight, which is uh, uh, a Tableau clone, but very poor Tableau clone, let me put it that way. And we, and we, and we support Tableau too. So uh, again, we went with quick. So the, we had Tableau, but one of the reasons that we didn't go Tableau first because the Tableau licensing was a nightmare. Um, Tableau took actually took much longer to get back to us to confirm that they wanted to work with us. Uh, and then we were getting pull, um, we were getting, um, uh, we had a delivery to meet milestone to met, uh, to be met and uh, because Tableau was refusing to work with us, we kind of just went with QuickSight. Uh, ended up happening six months later, Tableau agreed to our licensing, but by then we were already in uh, QuickSight. But a uh, few other groups out there use Tableau, so because we need to support them, we kind of like the uh, main uh, data processing group, so that's why we extended it to you, uh, Tableau to use us as well. Now, we don't, we don't officially uh, maintain Tableau, so they have, we still need to have um, Tableau licensing and servers on their end, but they can connect into our S3 buckets into our Postgres servers to actually extract the data. Oh, that reminds me, uh, we have Postgres today for Aurora Postgres, but we are, we've, we've been talking to Snowflake and we are probably migrating from Postgres to Snowflake in the not so distant future. So uh, from this, you know, we have a glue catalog, so we curate all of our uh, schemas into that. Uh, so this also allows us QuickSight to extract um, all of the uh, schemas without needing to have a create separate uh, schemas. Uh, Postgres tables also are able to um, load the data of sch uh, schema information from our, uh, um, uh, what do you call, um, glue data catalog. So it's one source of truth for all of our third party applications. The third piece that we also use is Athena, which is a Presto clone, uh, allows us to uh, write uh, 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 Presto SQL on top of S3 without having to actually store that into a database or data warehouse. So uh, we use that mainly for um, data sets that we don't load into Postgres. Today our uh, Postgres data sets is mainly um, uh, smaller, like we use only um, transform data sets or uh, um, the uh, use case focused uh, data sets. So we don't put all the data into Postgres because we don't want to uh, overload our Postgres uh, tables. It kind of makes sense. And for performance based, we kind of use Postgres mainly for performance. If there's query that needs more performance, let's push it there, push that into Postgres will kind of follow a similar pattern for Snowflake, but if uh, you're doing ad hoc querying, which doesn't, which means you don't need like high volume or high uh, performance, and then you can stay in S3. You can pull your data from there. Obviously, you can use uh, Athena for that. Athena connects to QuickSight, even Tableau supports it, so that allows you to pull back. And the response time is not too bad. I mean, in uh, in the his in in the past history, it maybe takes a minute, but now it's like seconds, maybe sometimes 10 seconds, but it comes back pretty quickly. You don't have to worry about it. So it's not too bad. So a lot of time for ad hoc coding, we focus on using Athena instead of going through uh, Postgres. So uh, what does that mean? Oh, it's my time. I just want to make sure I have um, 30 minutes. I have 30 minutes remaining. So we can go through this. So in order for data to be analyzed and useful, um, it needs to be related to each other. So this is one of the key uh, components that need to make sense. Even for your uh, data science team, your ML uh, teams, when they talk about cleaning scrubbing data, they always ask about, you know, how do we um, get, uh, how do we
world that can you know, relate to each other how do you make sense of the data that you want so uh, for, how do you understand that relation that exists between them part of that is you know having schemas that you can build that relationship against you know obviously ontologies can kind of make sense you know build uh, your metadata layer connect your metadata against your metadata to understand what the relationship exists between these tables so if you is it kind of like your foreign key associations is what you would think about from a metadata ontology uh, perspective so um, until you meet these two conditions and this is something that i took from the book by um, bill uh, inman uh, if you're familiar with him he's called the uh, father of the data warehouse um and uh, him and uh, uh, what's the other guy name um, uh, randall uh, is it randall so what is his name uh, uh, the snowflake uh, uh, the star schema i forgot his name what is yeah the those two are considered the godfathers of the data warehouse so um, bill inman said this you know data lake turns into a swamp and the swamp starts to smell after a while which is kind of true if you don't build something that you actually extract value from then just useless so how do you go from a data lake to a data lake house so uh, for the most part you have the analytical infrastructure in place with quicksight or tableau sourcing from various data sources and you need stage and report uh, and as well as ability to store structured semi structured and structured data but then you need a key component that would enable a true data lake house and that's when you talk about enterprise uh, data governance so i talked about this little bit earlier about you know having this whole framework of data governance but this is like the kind of like the standard for what that means um so multiple things come into data governance um things like data quality management data architecture data development operations security um metadata management master data management um uh, uh, and uh, document content management so I'll, if you take the whole um yeah uh, uh, what you call ecosystem of all these components that can kind of build your data governance but if you think about it i mean these components are not easy to build they not even um Uh, 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 and uh, it's not even like um, you uh, put an application there and suppose uh, supposedly will you know bring all this into a framework that you can actually use you actually have to spend hours if not days and you have to have a team that can work for each of these components and build them out uh, a lot of times you probably heard of this uh, um uh, term data steward which is supposed uh, supposedly so handle or uh, direction uh, the people uh, you know bring people together to build these components are, but uh, even the data steward i find it hard to build each of these components and that one of the big major reasons is the data silos that exist within organizations trying to talk to one side of the organization ask them to share data like you know trying to uh, pull your hair out of your head and get them to convince uh, convince them to actually work with you so challenges with data governance you know poor data quality cost real money uh, process efficiency negative impact by poor data governance and the benefits of new systems are not realized because again your data governance is so if you think about this let's say you build a data catalog you know one of the best data catalogs out there um who uses it will uh, be uh, will you know, obviously make a lot of use of it but the problem is your data catalog only stores data about your uh, system it has no information about uh, um systems in the other parts of the organization so uh, um you know let's say you're starting to come up with a new project or a new use case Uh, because um, you haven't looked into or delved into what the uh, other system store you probably may be reinventing the wheel because uh, you probably will start building a schema which already exists in some other part of the system but because you have no access to that or no insight you have actually rebuilt that whole schema into your data set you not understood the some of the nuances of the schema uh, why um, some of the changes being uh, applied in uh, the other side of the company and that makes uh you go through this whole cycle of understanding and trying to uh come up with a situation that's similar to what the other team has built so that that's a very uh, key component in understanding why most of um, most systems fail because they have no insight into silos within other part of the organization so objectives of data governance you know inform data uh, management uh, decision making ensure information is consistently defined well understood include increase the use or and trust of data as an organization or access it now this this requires a lot of um, you know, what do you call um, uh, support and tie in from your uh, higher ups it's so not something that engineers can do themselves building trust is something uh, it has to be a top down mentality 
you know, if you try to bottom approach it never work because you are asking other silos in the organization to uh, work with you and um, for most part most silos will refuse to work with you because it's not in their benefit uh, if you think of it, it's job security right in the end of the day if uh, that silo is working just making sure that um, they are doing their job they don't share the information they are more uh, um, it's it, uh, they feel that they're more unlikely to get you know laid off when something does happen so unless the uh, management mandates that all all the groups kind of work together you're not going to see that so um, then the flip side of this is management is uh, looks at the, you know on the bottom line uh, does it make money and uh, uh, most of this is uh, you know back end stuff it you probably won't see um, dollars you won't see any kind of value out of it until you spend time and money and effort and probably take maybe take a few years to see value out of it so you will also see that push back from management saying that you know this is a waste of time why are you even doing this and that that's another reason that you also see this fail because the amount of time you, you need to spend in this the amount of value that comes out of this is not uh, 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 valuable in the near near term and it's you need someone uh, um, someone in the management that understands it's the long term value of this if you don't have that it's hard to build use case or support for these kind of use cases uh, regulatory compliance and then eliminating data risks so uh, how about this so before we get into this, any questions so far so uh, how would this works so, um, this is a kind of the um, uh, system i've been working on this for several years uh, i kind of formulated this is a um, application a framework of how data governance can work at the uh, lower level obviously you have application dbs or object storage uh, storage as well you can have a uh, service oriented architecture services on top of that but then starting from that your your uh, your main framework would be your data security so things like your compliance you know anything regulatory uh, ccpa gdpr whatever that may mean is applied at the, at the base layer um, uh, um, uh, um, component of your organization or, or your uh, data framework uh, things that should work across the board auditing and workflow so you make sure that whatever happens you always keep track of that so anything uh, who, who touches your data when it was touched um, is the uh, um, um, uh, do, um, people who touch the data do have the right permissions for data all of that needs to be audited and stored somewhere so you can keep track of that in the future to make sure that um, um, the right access is being provided to the right person at the right time uh, on top of that you have data catalog i talked about this data catalog is kind of like single source of truth for all schema information allows um, downstream processes to pull that data uh, pull the schemas and appropriately uh, you know analyze and make changes to their uh, data sets as they move in the uh, pipeline process it also allows you to make changes on the fly and you know uh, um, uh, uh, um, notify your downstream process of those changes uh, one thing that we have done with our uh, data catalog is that um, depending on schema changes a uh, lot of them uh, new systems they do it but um, we handle it uh, additions uh, like um, when new columns are added we typically don't stop the process we kind of still flow um, but we kind of notify our end users that um, there is a new column in place if you want to use it you can use it uh, none of the downstream process we um, you can say we don't uh, you cannot use select star you have to use name columns i mean uh, it's become a typical best practice if you're doing sql you have to do uh, in the individual sql columns and don't do select star because uh, that that will break your uh, queries downstream uh, but uh, uh, if uh, columns are modified or columns are deleted we actually kill the process uh, we notify downstream process that there is a critical uh, component change uh, talk to um, now th this this typically happens when your uh, upstream providers don't notify you so uh, because our upstream providers are sometimes third party providers even within the company itself they don't people in other parts of organization won't tell you when they change the schema that's uh, one of the key things not we have not noted as well so they, they don't tell you changes happen and then something breaks and then after you go back and say hey wow why is this broken why are you making changes or notification is oh we forgot to tell you so <laughs> those are the things that you have to deal with but because the system is built uh, to handle failure in place that's one of the things it's uh, um, we look at something called graceful degradation if you fail you need to fail gracefully you cannot uh, fail abruptly um, you should be able to handle that situation in a way that does not cause too many failure points so we know we are we are bound to fail we just handle it much more better than situations in the past 
when we talk about data lineage so for us um, this is something we are working on but the data lineage is basically telling us how the data landed in the uh, final place so how is it transformed so right from the source uh, where the data came in from what kind of transformations it went through and then how did it land as okay. i so by keeping the data lineage tracker you have a complete understanding of where that source of the data came in from what uh, cells elements were used to uh, to apply what business logic was used to apply to that uh, to convert into that final uh, transformation that you wanted um, then on top of that metadata management and then master data management um, master data management is uh, been there for many years um, it's something that's important because that kind of gives you more um, uh, kind of finalized view of how your data should be uh, especially when there is um, uh, conflicting data across the board so uh, it kind of creates this clean data set that you can work against master data management creates business rules to make uh, um, conflicting data more streamlined and level set across the organization any questions so go ahead So good question. So a couple of things over here. Uh, first of all, um, I mean, um, there's obviously third-party application tool sets that are supposedly, um, you know, help you do that. So if you heard of Tamar, uh, it's one application tool set that people have talked about about doing data cleansing. Also Tamar? Tamar, T-A-M-R. Uh, but but uh, in, for us, I mean, we don't have the luxury of using third-party tools. So uh, we uh, most of it is written through code. So we have business um, rules in place. Now we understand a lot of our data, how it should be. Uh, uh, for example, SSN. If we get SSN that doesn't come in a uh, form that we realize, uh, or if, um, it could happen that you know um, uh, the data is moved because you know extra spaces come in the data set, or um, there is uh, some kind of uh, m uh, um, mangling of the data. So you have to right, have business rules in place to handle that kind of. Uh, 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 what do you call um, challenges? Data quality challenges. So we have third part. We have business rules in place that kind of reads the data set. We have uh, checks in place to look at the data, we kind of convert the data. So if you see something that's broken, if a uh, if a l extra new line is added to the data, it goes on to the next next line and causes the d data to kind of break up. You know, we kind of bring the merged data back into one line. So we look at multiple things that come and use business logic to write that out. I wouldn't recommend that for everybody uh, unless you understand your data set really well. So um, if you don't understand your data set very well, it's very hard. Now, uh, third party data, when you see these issues, it's harder for us to identify that uh, because of the data sets are coming from upstream. And sometimes we don't understand the use case because uh, downstream um, our users are more uh, attuned to how they want to use a data set. So uh, it becomes a challenge in those cases. But when it's data sets that we understand, we're able to apply better rule sets and uh, quality control on that data. So if, uh, it's not a com so we haven't solved it completely, and I would say some point later we may want to look at solving it by applying third-party tools. Uh, but then again, it's also um, uh, you know cost basis. I mean, do you want to put a third-party tool and spend the money for that, or do you want to spend the time and effort in building rules within your system to handle that? So it's a cost uh, be, uh, uh, cost analysis at the point, which makes more sense. I mean, spending the time and effort in building the product or uh, building the uh, business logic or having third-party tool to do it. That make sense? Uh, so uh, importance of data catalog. Uh, so this one is a uh, slide I picked up from years ago, uh, kind of like gives you an idea of who is going to be using uh, the data catalog, where they use the data catalog. So for reports, uh, most of the time your reports, uh, metrics and definition, they are pretty much uh, centralized and focus on your uh, business users. Uh, because if uh, most business users, they're only interested in the reporting dashboard, report is interested in the metrics and definitions for those reports, but they're not really concerned over the remaining pieces. Your business analysts, uh, they you know, obviously want reports and metrics and definition, but on top of that, they like data sets, queries, models and views. 
uh, then your uh, report developers analysis they go one step lower refined data data science uh, uh, data scientists want to go to the atomic data and then finally your ETL developers who actually focus on the source of the data uh, data sources systems where the data comes from uh, you know transformations and bits and bits. this one kind of gets uh, idea of focus of where each person you know each uh, structure uh, of the organization is focused on which uh, uh, um, um, source of the uh, truth of the data that it comes from so I like this because it kind of tells that story of who wants to use what and at what uh, 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 stage of the data when it uh, uh, lands in the final system conceptual architecture so this is the my conceptual year 3000 thing if I can get this to work it will be awesome but this is something that you know, is years in the making uh, at the very lowest level it's a services platform uh, you know, obviously you want to build something that microservices have something you can automatically uh, source data from multiple places which you can have do today but then on top of that you have a security compliance framework your AI catalog services, reporting services, orchestration uh, on top of that auditing workflow data security, privacy compliance, data catalog all of the data, data governance tools and then uh, on top of that you have microservices, API, gateway um, your authentication um, authorization and ac um, uh, accounting, which is your uh, single sign-on and um, uh, capturing, um, you know, uh, permissions for the users at a very uh, higher level. So that's one source of truth for permissioning. And then finally, your uh, systems that it comes from, you know, on-premise, AWS, partner, consumer intelligence. So you, sorry, go ahead. So data lineage is as I mentioned the same uh, uh, keeping track of how um, your source of the data like right to the transformations to when it actually shows up in the report so this specific element they're looking at you know trying to understand how the element landed in, in that place what are the source of the data what kind of transformation what's the business logic that is applied to that data lineage will tell you the whole story so you actually when you look in the report you actually know oh this is where it came from and this is how it was transformed So as I mentioned, it's very important for the data governance to happen is you need to have a partnership with your business. Uh, um, with data governance, a top-down approach is what makes things happen. If you don't have a sponsor for you, it's going to be harder for you to um, build this out. So data management is a shared responsibility between data management professionals within IT, business data owners, representing the interests of data. Now, um, you, um, you, should, you should be able to convince your business stakeholders that if they don't do this, their value for the data is uh, diminished. Um, some business holders, they, they're only concerned about uh, specific reports. So they, maybe they'll say, okay, I don't care about that. But some of them will be like, okay, how can I get more value from the data? So in those few cases, you can actually convince them to say, you know, if you sponsor this, you can actually see more value. If you have a data scientist, they are, they'll be more on your side because they will be the ones who will also be uh, supporting your use case to say that, um, you know, we need to see this value, we need to see this uh, um, kind of um, extract the value from the data and the only way we can do this is applying these logic and business transformations to the source data so we can make uh, uh, um, structured value informed decisions from this to uh, supply it to our business stakeholders so it's a concern it's accountability for both parts you know business and IT um, business data owners are data subject matter experts and they represent the data interests of both business and take responsibility for quality and user data so um, I'm coming to the end, I'm almost um, done. So one of the things I want to talk about, uh, so uh, I don't know how many guys are familiar with this, but uh, Matt Turk is a, a, a venture capitalist. Um, he's, he, uh, every year he comes out with this thing called MAD, which is a machine learning, artificial intelligence, and data landscape. Uh, he came out with this last October. I think he'll probably do one this October, but it kind of, um, you, can, you can search for Matt Talk uh, again. It kind of uh, talks about all of the application tools in the data ecosystem. From here, we're just talking machine learning, artificial and data. If you see this, I just took a screenshot of this and see the number of application tools. Uh, this is humongous. Um, I, I, it's hard to read even what's in here, but uh, if you um, uh, look at this, you should actually see the entire, uh, uh, if you search on Matt Talk, you can actually see this. It's so humongous, it's probably like a thousand applications and tools that are used in the environment. Uh, you don't even know which ones are, should be used for your to, um, you know, use case. And second thing is a lot of them are overlaps. So you, uh, sometimes 
if you if you look at one tool set there it does bits and pieces of what you want there's another two tool set there will do bits and pieces of what you want so uh, it's a good way just to understand the complexity and the number of tools that are out there that kind of do everything so from data processing data transformation data hosting data warehousing databases what do we talk about that's a lot of them out there now i just picked up the data piece from this so uh, the one i showed you previous to this was ai machine learning and data now from data i just uh, took a screenshot of the data i i wanted to highlight in the data world there is this much but even in the data piece is probably like hundreds of applications so you can see storage hadoop data lakes data warehouses uh, streaming um, rdbms is no sql database new sql database real time database, graph db so you can see just from this amount of applications and tools right? so it kind of mind bog boggling the amount of things that you probably you now in most most of time your day to day job you don't have to worry about this but um, it's good to know at least to know what's out there so that when you do tools evaluation when you're trying to see what can make your life easier you actually just understand or oh, maybe this is something that i need to look at uh, it also kind of uh, talks to what's the future holding for the data world Under understanding where the data is moving to how data is being transformed is important like to me i always see that data is evolving you cannot be stuck with what you are today because uh, tomorrow things change rapidly and if you don't know, understand what's out there you know you could be behind the curve so just you know keeping your open mind understanding what's out there will always help you in the future uh this is another one that came about a month ago uh, this is by lake fs and this is mainly focused on data engineering but again this is also another one that talks about just from a data engineering landscape what are the tools that's out there so for ingest tools uh um, ingest tech object storage meta store op um, open table formats compute analytics engine git orchestration ml ops uh data data center ki ml observability so a lot of things are out there um, to just look from data engineering perspective uh, i talked to you about databricks which is kind of become the standard for data processing um snowflake people have been talking about it as a uh, replacement data warehouse i mean a lot of people talk about snowflake today uh, they been uh, if you know redshift is also uh, uh, big in data warehousing though it kind of lost its uh, luster because of snow, uh, snowflake snowflake actually kind of took all the uh, shine from snowflake you now redshift is actually uh, they actually trying to compete with snowflake and they uh, released a lot of features to make it comp uh, uh, feature compatible with snowflake so they trying to get back into the game um but uh, um uh, from a data data warehouse perspective snowflake from a um data processing uh, uh, uh framework processing its um, uh, data bricks and the other thing to note now data bricks and data snowflake actually trying to eat into each other's business because they have become huge mammoth uh, uh businesses that the only way they can grow is when they can actually uh, compete with each other so now you will see data bricks actually saying they have a data warehouse uh, and snowflake saying they actually have a data processing engine so it's it's a very funny that everyone is trying to compete with each other by expanding the thing and obviously all the cloud have their own inbuilt in grown uh processing uh, landscapes that they kind of promote so everyone is trying to each in, into each other's uh, um you know piece of the pie um uh, and just put references out here if you want and then uh, i want to talk about data connelly so i host this conference once a year um we're going to be doing it in two weeks um data connelly august 13th at usc um it's a full day of conference talks if you want more information go to data connelly i have a complimentary code for you guys out here so if you um looking to attend uh, it's uh, um valid for 20 people and it expires uh, tomorrow so um, you know feel free to attend it's at usc downtown la so i have oh sorry go ahead so that's a code yep. grab it so that's all i had any questions Uh, <laughs> hopefully this will be informative and you know yeah. help you guys out. Yeah. Sure, one, one Go ahead. Uh, are you supporting any streaming analytics use cases? So we just started doing that. So uh, today um, we um, we are um, doing manage Kafka. So the plan is to start uh, expanding that use cases. 
So a part of that is what you're doing is uh, uh, using student data. So we're getting student data from the campuses. Um, it, uh, this is a very small subset use case for the student data. We're trialing this out, but the plan is to expand that to more use cases as we progress. But we want to bring in more student data, uh, use that to leverage uh, for student success. Now one of the, the part of that is uh, understanding how we can um, help our students succeed, you know, uh, or graduate um, their classes better. So we're bringing that use cases in uh, currently. Traditional file. It's a traditional object storage that we're getting, but uh, so we still have all of the data coming in in a traditional um, uh, like um, um, once a day loading the reform. But um, because we are saying um, we kind of committed that we wanted to build this in a more streaming application architecture, we started with a small use case. So we've told the campuses, you know, start shooting the data towards more frequently. So we're doing now. It's a 15 minute. Uh, uh, push. We kept our, um, um, our APIs of uh, Kafka APIs open, so they push into that every 15 minutes, and then we have a Kafka queue that reads off that every 15 minutes and loads it into a, a, a Firehose or our S3 uh, file system. We have a Lambda, um, uh, what do you call, um, application that once it loads in, we do um, uh, that uh, reads off this uh, data that lo uh, comes into the uh, uh, our S3 f buckets and then process the data um, on a 15-minute um, uh, pipeline. So every 15 minutes we process the data, and then we load it into our, uh, uh, our, our reporting dashboard. Now we uh, rebase, the every every day we do rebasing the data, because we cannot do the uh, cumulative and addition of the data on top of our data. We don't, uh, because we try to do more real-time analytics, um, so we kind of uh, rebase once a day, like we redo the whole uh, processing the data at the end of the day, and then we, uh, um, so when the new 15 minute version of the data comes in, it just applies on top of that. So people can see, it's, it's, it's called near real time, not actual um, real time, because of the fact that it does not encapsulate the real true, uh, um, uh, what do you call, um, uh, 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 true value of the data until it uh, gets loaded with the whole previous data set, and that happens once a day. Does that make sense? Yeah, but we, we don't, we don't, we don't, that you do happens only at the end of the day. So at the beginning of the day, we just kind of just put it in. So sometimes we, uh, we kind of say that uh, we probably see um, multiple uh, records, a uh, few more records than we see in the, uh, the real-time data. We've kind of set expectations, the user that will see this, but at the end of the day, uh, all of that goes away. Any other questions? No, no, all, we are across, so, yeah, I mean, the use case for streaming is right now just one of the campuses, we are testing a small portion of it. Once we show success that this can work, we'll expand it to all campuses. Now, so one of the other things you also need to understand, every campus is independent, so even though we, you know, announce it to the group, it's up, up I mean, announce it to the campuses, it's up to the campus to say if they want to join us or not. Uh, lot, and the other part of that other is, the, um, is that all uh, campuses also, they have their own architecture and technology, so some of them are uh, very uh, reluctant to do what we want, I mean, to join us, because they say, oh, we have our own way of processing the data. So uh, we, um, we kind of enforce this for all of our, um, uh, what do you call, um, um, batch data. So batch data, we get it no matter what. But the streaming data, because it's a small use case, and we, uh, we started off with one campus, um, we don't know if other campuses will join. We still get the batch data on a daily basis, but we don't know about if they will uh, um, um, if they'll want to join us before the streaming pure portion of audit. Okay. Uh, I was more asking the on not the streaming data, more of like the architecture you were showing us all. Oh yeah, so yeah, uh, the once the data comes into us, it, we do it. So we process for all the campuses. But every campus is on their own. So they may, uh, even though they give us the data, they may do their own processing on their end. So I know Northridge, uh, they are a big Oracle shop, and uh, they're still focused on using Oracle quite a bit. So um, they, uh, they're looking to move to the cloud, but even today, from what I understand, is that they're hosting Oracle on the cloud. And that's what they're doing. They're not following 
the data engineering practices that you set in place. We have offered to share our code pipeline, um, but uh, again, a lot of the legacy uh, you know, uh, mentality is there with most campuses, and um, they kind of uh, um, want to stick with that. And plus, they all have their own vendors, um, so they, uh, they want to stick with their own vendors. They want to, they don't want to like uh, follow best practices or come. What we do is kind of we have pushed the boundaries of what, what we have done. Not many people do in the in the education world, like in higher education. What we are doing today, most most organizations are not doing. So we have kind of been pushing the boundary on what um, higher education should be moving towards. So um, from that perspective, it's harder to convince other campuses to do what. Even though we have offered to share our uh, you know repositories, code base, and so on and so forth. How does that? How does that keep in? Since I since I joined, two and a half years. Any other questions? Awesome. Thank you guys. I appreciate it.